Today is Monday, May 21st, 2018. My name is Beth Ann Kelsch and I'm in the Rubenstein Library at Duke University with Laura Mickham, UNCG class of 1992. And we are here to conduct an oral history interview for the UNCG Institutional Memory Collection. Hi, Laura. Hi, Beth Ann. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'd like to start the interview by asking you about your background. If you could tell me where and when you were born. I was born in 1969 in Cleveland, Ohio. And do you have brothers and sisters? I have a, an older sister called Kathleen, who is about four and a half years older than I am. Okay, and your parents, what did your parents do? They owned a mom and pop real estate company in Ohio, including the time that we lived in North Carolina, which was the end of my childhood, and where I established, where I had residency uh, at the end of high school, and so went to UNCG. So they sold Ohio real estate from North Carolina? <laughs> my father comm uh, commuted to work. Uh, okay. Anyway. Okay. Uh, where did you go to high school? In South Carolina. <laughs> Um, at a place called Spartanburg Day School in Spartanburg, South Carolina. We, it was a very long commute. Uh, when we first moved to North Carolina from Ohio, my sister and I um, were told or had to, or it was determined that we should skip a grade. But socially, that, that proved to be really, really difficult. And culturally, that proved to be really, really difficult. So we went back to Ohio for a time and then came back to North Carolina, at which point my parents enrolled us in this sort of college prep school in Spartanburg. Uh, which is a long journey from home every day. Um, How long and, and when, what year was this? Like where were you? In I think I was, in, I was in that school from fifth or sixth grade through high school. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was, it was a very middle, upper middle, upper class, straight, white, heterosexual, southern place at which, and it was tiny, I graduated with 28, 27 or 8 other kids, and I was a total misfit in, in, in all, that environment. In all aspects? <laughs> in all aspects, as far as I could tell. No doubt there were other people who were hiding aspects of themselves, but as far as uh, that time period and um, what that culture would allow, um, what we were allowed to be open about, uh, you know, it was very homogenous, extremely homogenous. So, um, so I didn't uh, really have any any friends who were very much like me. I had friends, but not close friends, if you see what I mean. I was distant. Did you know you were queer then? Yes, I had some, I had a good sense of it. So I, my, my first crush was on, I can't believe I'm saying this to you little people, I can't say this without laughing, Nadia Comaneci, the gymnast. Aww, <laughs> that's sweet. I was a gymnast, so I had a huge crush wow. on her. Well, duh. Yeah. And other, you know, so, but yeah. Did you I play Nadia's theme over and over and over uh, again? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that happened or not. <laughs> but, but I had a lot of crushes on girls and um, a couple in particular, but I knew that it would be um, completely foolish to say any of that out loud, either at school or at home or to anyone. So I kept it entirely to myself. That must have been hard. Uh, well, I'm in good company. <laughs> many of us, many of us that, had that, that experience. Um, I just knew I knew what was expected, and um, especially by the time I got to my junior and senior year, my uh, it was much better all the way around, just to fly as far into the radar as possible, which I got really pretty good at doing. Okay, and so why did you uh, apply to UNCG? So I had um, in-state residency. I lived in North Carolina. Um, it was pretty clear that I was going to be supporting myself through school and um, I liked what I read about UNCG, uh, which was not a lot. I mean, it was not, it was the pre-internet time, so it was not like you could be the savvy traveler about shopping for colleges um, then as you can be now in many ways. So it was on relatively little information. It was mostly that I understood that I could probably pay for it. I could probably get enough jobs to support myself and pay for it and it seemed like a you know, congenial atmosphere. <laughs> So you preferred that over Chapel Hill, for example? I don't even remember why I was more drawn to UNCG than UNC Chapel Hill. I'm not even sure why that was necessarily the case. I can't, I was trying to place that ahead of this interview and I can't remember. I think I read something, something that seemed to tip me off, but I, I, I honestly can't, 
I can't call that back up again. Tip you off. It's to why I, I was more focused on UNCG than UNC Chapel Hill. I just can't, I can't call that back up in the okay. way back in there. And maybe it'll okay. surface during this hour or so. Okay. And so there were, did you apply to other <laughs> schools or you were like, and one application done? I was kind of one application and done. Whatever I read, you know, I ordered stuff through the mail because that's what you did then. Mm -hmm. um, and I, but I also looked at, uh, you know, those re reference books that you would see in the public library. And mm -hmm. you're I looked at those and whatever else. You know, it just seemed like this was a good place. I knew that I, I could, I seemed to be able to, my grades and whatever else seemed to line up with the criteria to get in. And um, high school was hard. I was, I was pretty unhappy uh, all the way around. And I, I just wanted to choose the place that I knew I could go to and, and um, that would work out financially and otherwise and do that. Okay. It was almost like a job. <laughs> so this was, you started, matriculated in 1988? That's right. Okay. Um, all right. So you made your decision. It's 1988. August rolls around. Uh, what were your first days like? What was your first impression? Oh, this is very good. So I, I arrived and I was um, placed in the wrong dorm and I don't know how. So I had already found out, one of the things I had found out during my application process was that there was a brand new international studies program. Mm -hmm. And I was really interested in that. That was one of those things that was very different than any experience I'd had um, in any sense in high school. So I, I wanted to do it and it was a new program and I thought this must be really cool. Mm -hmm. um, I was also interested in psychology for a variety of different mostly misguided reasons, um, but the international studies was like this, this, and it's brand new, this is going to be great. So I tried to do whatever was necessary to make that happen over the summer, but it just didn't, it didn't work out again. You know, it's not the internet world where you can like sort these, and even now it's not easy to deal with university bureaucracy anywhere. So I knew what I had sussed out was that there was a dorm associated with that new program. So I get to campus and I'm, and, um, and you know, Frankly, I just wanted to deal with it myself. I just, I, I was in that, still in that generation of people where mom, you know, mom and dad drop you off and they're like, have a good life. There was no mom and dad stay for a couple of days and get, and get an oriented, nothing like that. They were there for an hour. And I knew that I was not gonna stay in this dorm. So I left all my stuff packed up and I went in search of whoever I could find who could find who could link me formally to the international studies program. And I, I don't remember all the details of that. I just know that in short order, like within days, I was moved to Guilford Hall that had previously for its existence forever, however long at that point, been a dorm for upper class male athletes. And they turned over one wing, one wing to 18, 18 year old women who were starting in the, in the international studies program. Yes. It was uh, really, really misguided the university. I, as far as we can understand it, it was because it was across from Mary Faust, which was a special program dorm, and they were trying as hard as they could to create a special program dorm across from Mary Faust, despite the fact that the people who lived there really didn't want to stop living there, stop having it be the culture that it was. So these 18, 18 year old women. Out of how many people, guys, were in the dorm? So they were. There was three floors, two wings on each floor. There were 18 women, and then each of the other four pieces, if you will, right, were upper class male athletes. So, so like, it was unsafe. Yeah. It was god awful in every single way. Um, they made it clear to us as we were moving in, you know, and of course I was a few days late, uh, that they didn't want us there, and they were going to make it very clear that that they were going to do everything in their power to harass us out of there. And so we decided that we were not going to let that happen. So very quick bonding, but you guys took it upon, you all took it upon yourself to fight back versus... We did. So little did I know how formative this would be. So the, one of the first things that ha happened, I mean, this had to be in the first couple days because um, I was determined that I wanted to be in this program. So mm -hmm. it was in the first couple days, I was still in the first blush because the rest of the women there were just moving in too. So I know that not much time could pass. I looked out of my window and I saw this guy going around um, this curve and I could, he was on a bicycle and I could see that he was going really quickly and couldn't see that there was a speed bump. And I couldn't get the window open because it was painted shut to say, dude. <laughs> All right. And he hit the speed bump, flew off his bike, broke his collarbone and I ran out there and um, he turned, that turns out to be my oldest, closest friend. Oh, who wow. just came and visited me this weekend, Michael Farrow. Oh. And so How he do you also, spell Farrow's name? F-A-O-R-O. -O. So he ended up transferring, but he was there for the first couple of years of college and we are still close. So I, 
sort of carried him in and then took him, whatever, to the health center and all the rest of it. But um, I had already, along with these women, sort of sussed out that we were not safe. This, this guy, Michael Farrow, was six foot four, and at that point a skater punk. And I didn't have a roommate. And so I said, you need somebody to look after you. You're broken. I need a six foot four skater punk. And so do the rest of these women, just to stand up every once in a while and tell these, the rest of these guys to fuck off. Is that a good deal for you? And he said, yeah, I don't like the dorm they put me in. So, okay. So I moved him in my room. And there were no... <laughs> that was actually not something that was accommodated at UNCG at the time, that I would have a roommate. But I decided that under the circumstances, mm -hmm. it, it seemed reasonable. And nobody was paying attention. And so that's what we did. That's, and, that's great. And, how, so and he was incredible. He was really quite helpful. Not in that he was not, you know, beating up athletes every mm -hmm. day. He was just, he would just, you know. He was being large and male. Yeah. And also we banded together as a group of women. And so, but still, you know, you get tired of this crap after a while. So mm -hmm. I decided, um, I, don't, I didn't realize that, I know this is probably surprising to you, but I honestly didn't realize at the time that I would either be um, incredibly uh, deeply feminist or have the ability to speak truth to power. Neither one of those things were available to me sort of as a part of my existence yet, but the combination of that experience in that dorm, you know, the first few weeks, and the fact that the guy who was running the International Studies program was this young, straight guy who didn't seem to be sensitive to our concerns brought out of me what, you know, in many ways was incredibly formative because I, we were talking amongst ourselves, these women, about our concerns and our irritations and our worries about our safety uh, and how inappropriate we thought it was that we were placed there, I said, you know, we should go talk to him. And most of them said, oh, we don't want to do that, we don't want to do it. We just started, we don't want to rock the boat. And, I, and they decided that maybe I would be, could be a good boat rocker. Again, I had no idea that I could be a boat, good boat rocker. So mm -hmm. I decided to go and try. So I went and saw him mm -hmm. and said, uh, you know, I, these women have asked me to come and talk to you. These are our concerns. This is what's already happening. This is what we see. These guys get drunk every night. They hit on us, whatever. I didn't mention Michael because my friend, because I didn't want him to be kicked out of the dorm. So that was a secret. And he said, and I'll never forget this. This is seared on my memory. Don't lie to me. Every night you go to bed and you fantasize about all those men. And you would never want to be anywhere else but there because you fantasize about those students every night. Oh my that's, God. What, that's what young women do. That's, and so don't complain to me. It's what you want is to be with those male students. So it was like I was thrown up in the air and I landed a militant, angry, uh -huh. bitter feminist. Wow. <laughs> in that moment. So <laughs> I guess no one would expect that answer. So what happened next with? I said, you're wrong. That doesn't describe any of our experiences. We're genuinely concerned and we'll be glad to go and address our concerns to other people if you don't feel like you can manage that and it just you know turned out to be an ongoing conversation um, during which he basically you know over the course of time during which I felt like the message he was sending was he didn't really care if we stayed in the program or not okay and I, so I don't get now having been in academia for 20 plus years I, I'd look back and I think he was young enough he was probably an assistant professor was he forced to do that I mean what was that was it a service gig he didn't really want like what was his calculation which I could not have worked out at the time I was too young and inexperienced in academia but um, so I still try to work that out. But suffice to say that most of those women did not stay, either in that dorm or in that program. I was one of two women who graduated with an international studies degree in that program. And it was partly because, God damn it, I was going to. Right. God, <laughs> did you go over this uh, guy's head? Or would, would you? Do, I did. And did they do anything? Not much, no. So you just spent the rest of the year with the job? With Michael. Drunk jocks. <laughs> Michael and the drunk jocks. <laughs> Yeah, and then um, at UNCG at the time you had to be on campus for two years, so I actually spent two years. In Guilford. Yeah, but so the second year there were two, the whole first floor was women, mm -hmm. instead of the fr only just, you know, one-sixth of us or whatever, there were, you know, one-third of the, you know, so at least there was a whole floor, and um, perhaps the upper floors were, you know, more thought, I think, like, for example, some of the, they, they were still men, but they were, um, some of them were international studies. So they weren't all jocks. Yeah. Because I think Michael in the second year, he joined the international studies program just so he could stay in the dorm, I think, Aww. and um, lived with a, you know, some regular dude up in the second floor or third floor or whatever. I have images of going up there and hanging out with them up there. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the dorm got better, and I don't know if that was a conscious 
piece of care work on the part of the administration or what it was. Hmm. But so besides your <clears throat> hellacious dorm situation, <laughs> what, did you have any other first impressions, um, second impressions? Well, I met the people at Barry Faust and I liked all of them right away. I remember feeling like yeah, that would be nice, you know, because they, they all seemed really liberal and progressive and nice and, you know, like-minded and laid back and, and sweet and all that. And I remember thinking, dang. But you couldn't just go to Mary Faust. I mean, that was also a thing you had to apply for and all the rest of it. It was a whole application program within a program at UNCG, and that was, it was just not. It you, was, you didn't want to try to do it sophomore year or junior? No? I can't remember why, but it didn't make sense. I think it, I, it, I quickly thought, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to make it work. I'm going to graduate with this degree just to spite that guy. And as soon as I get off campus, I'm going to move off campus, which is what I did. Okay, so any other impressions of the general student body or the general atmosphere or professors? General? Maybe it's because I was wearing like the big invisible yet visible thing on my chest that said, you know, queer, feminist, survivor of abuse and harm. You know, maybe I was just giving off those signals, but I met lots of um, other queer folks pretty quickly. And I don't remember, I don't, I mean, like, I don't have specific memories of, of that. I just know that we were all drawn to each other really quickly. In social settings or just? Yeah, but it's not like I didn't go to bars. I didn't really go to parties that much. So I just, you know, there was just this group that seemed to gel. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't all queer folks. I mean, Michael's a straight guy, but it was, a, it, but it was you know, it was like the continuum of queerness and we were drawn to each other fairly quickly through various means in classes and at the library I don't know like we just were and I don't it, too much time has passed to be able to trace that in any kind of a more detailed way I guess you might say okay um, was UNCG what you expected yeah I suppose I was so happy to be away from that high school mm -hmm. and away from home and relatively more in charge and with a plan forward mm -hmm. I was good okay yeah I was not I was not unhappy my expectations were not huge I mean it wasn't like college students these days right that come in with the plan yeah. so you said did you say your major was psychology or so I started with psychology and like almost instantly as you know within hours International studies. It was my intention even before I got there. I, again, I can't remember. I just remember reading about it that summer and, and wanting to pursue it. I, I'm sure I was sent the information by the school. Mm -hmm. um, and then within the first uh, semester, probably, maybe the second semester, I discovered the women's studies program. Mm -hmm. Did you change over to that? I didn't. Well, as a minor, because there was a no major at the time, I think, if I remember correctly. So. Okay. Yeah, and I think maybe international studies was a concentration, or I don't know, or maybe it was a major. I think it was a major by the time I finished. We can look that up. Yes. <laughs> we have the power. So, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do with your international studies? Oh, yeah, I totally did, which is so funny because it has, well, I mean, it has a lot and nothing to do with what I ended up doing. I, I really thought that I would become a feminist therapist, counselor, person with international cultural competencies who we work with wow, queer actually, people and immigrants and that's a plan it's not a bad i mean no, it's, it's not. totally <laughs> reasonable and fair and appropriate you, plan i'm just it turns out not the right person to pursue that plan so that was your first during your first year you oh like, no i thought that for a long time i actually got into um uh, a counseling program a counseling graduate program oh wow yeah but deferred because I wasn't totally sure, partly because, um, so I applied to it and I really, I had um, all of the criteria, GRE and grades and everything else and didn't hear, didn't hear, didn't hear. So I called the program and said, so what's up? And they said, oh, we lost your application, sorry. And I said, well, does that mean you're not gonna consider it? No, it looks like you you're, you got it here on time, according to the postmark, you gotta love those days. So we really, we should consider it. So they said, give us X number of days. So then they called, this is the MED program at UNCG. So this is also relevant. I'm sure it was here. It wasn't here, it was there. Uh, and so they called me and said, you got in. And I said, great. So what is the package? They said, oh, we've already given those away. So you have to pay for it. And I said, no. no. <laughs> I <can't. laughs> Ouch. Yeah, so I said, how about if I defer for a year? Will you have, can we talk again about finances? Yes, that'd be great. And um, I moved to Durham that year after um, 
after I graduated and it just I just knew as to you know I wasn't even sure you know when I when I got the acceptance that it was exactly the right plan okay. but in the year I was here after graduation um, yeah. okay um, do, do you remember any particular favorite classes professors yeah, so there was, my faculty advisor was a guy called David Soderquist, who was a real character, very funny. Um, so I, I thought, of course, that I was interested in all the clinical courses in psychology, right? Uh, he was actually, he, uh, his focus was on brain psychology, mm -hmm. and I loved it, and I did really well in it, I, and I really enjoyed it. And he was very supportive. He was, you know, not a modern guy in many ways, but he was very supportive in other ways that were really critical to me. Um, but I, having spent a couple of semesters by then or so in women's studies, it seemed the logical thing to do to go to the two women in the department and talk to them about the idea of um, PhD education in psychology. One of them said to me, you have to be as much like a man as possible to succeed. That is what she said, and I'm quoting her. So that was off-putting for some reason. And the do other you, one do said... Do you want to name names? Or no? I can't. I don't remember. Don't I don't remember. Okay. So one woman said that. The other woman who was at least on the surface seemingly more feminist in some sense said don't whatever you do don't do this it's awful okay <laughs> <laughs> well <laughs> so, <laughs> i decided against it which is why I, I applied to the med you know the counseling program wow did she say she, why it was awful or just she said it was just a grinding god awful <laughs> experience from start to finish as a career or as a um, degree Oh, she's, I mean, she said that it was still male-dominated. Uh, I mean, okay. I told her what my background was and what my interests were, and she was like, it'll be, it'll be an awful experience for you. I'm not going to lie. And I said, well, thank you, I guess. <laughs> wow. So you also, what, any other classes, professors? So there was a person who taught. So I wanted to take as much as I possibly could, right? Mm -hmm. Because, again, I felt like the curriculum at my high school was all college prep um, and really homogenous and really Western and white and... So you're trying to learn so everything else. And I wanted to do everything else. Got and it. so I did, um, you know, I, I, there was a time that I was a total, you know, I, space cadet and wanted to minor in everything under the sun. And my sister had to do a little take charge moment <laughs> and say, you can't minor in anything else. Stop. Because right. <laughs> so, I was so excited about every opportunity. And so there were, there was a class on um, sort of Russian history and culture, but it was focused on glasnost, you know, in that whole mm -hmm. era of post-Soviet and post-Soviet Russia. And this, the teacher was fantastic. I don't remember her name. I feel like her first name might have been Stephanie, but she was wonderful. So incredibly compelling as a teacher. And I was learning something that, of course, I not had any opportunity to learn before. And it was, of course, helpful in some sense. It satisfied something in my uh, international studies degree, so I loved it. And then there was a course I took in anthropology about Jane Goodall, and so of course I developed a crush on Jane Goodall, as you would, <laughs> as one does. <laughs> so that was, so that was that was memorable. And, and for a time, I thought maybe I would be would minor in that until I said, <laughs> in <laughs> no. Jane Goodall. <laughs> That's right, my degree in Jane. <laughs> so, so I, no, but I remember that it was a really it was a really good course. Besides, um, and then some of the women's studies courses were amazing. I mean, amazingly, they introduced me to people whose papers I are here in the Sally Bam Center. Like the first um, Robin Morgan texts I read were UNCG, and they were really meaningful to me. Um, and also um, Alice Alice Walker. And both of them in their constructions of bisexuality and their constructions of sexuality and of feminist ways of thinking about um, these things were meaningful to me. Now, was John D'Amelio there during Yes, <laughs> he was. Did you, did you, <laughs> my. Did so, you take so, it? No, I'm happy because you reminded me of something that I otherwise might have forgotten. So um, for some class, and I don't, I don't know what, it probably wasn't psychology because most of what I was taking was brain psych there, so I don't know what, what I was taking, although I took some sociology classes, so maybe it was in that context. Maybe history? I don't know. No, I know he was in history, so, oh, okay. so here's the story. The back story is, is that some class I took, there was some content that was about homosexuals, and I was stupidly out enough that I, um, there must have been something in the syllabus and the coursework and what the faculty member said, and I will never remember who that is, that seemed to call on anybody who might be willing to talk about their personal experience, and I stupidly decided I would offer. And so I offered, and um, I talked to the class about my experience, and apparently I did it in a way that was useful to that person because he said, have you met John D'Amelio? And I had no idea. 
idea who John to me there is, which is why I only think of now. So that's how I met John, was that faculty member introduced us. And I, John would never remember me in a year of Sundays, of course, but of course I could never forget him. Um, I took. You never know. No, he would, I would okay. not expect him to. I really okay. wouldn't. Except that we were on. I started speaking to classes, so I was asked, you know, I was one of the few people who was a matriculating undergraduate student at the time who was willing to talk about queerness, and that's not the term we used at the time, but um, to classes, and then I was on, for one of those, I was on a panel with him and somebody else, I can't remember who else, I just remember being starstruck by being on a panel with John Emilio about this, but after one of those, not that one, I don't think, but it's... I can imagine why it might have been that one. I came home, that's when I was, I was either a junior or senior, and I was, I was living just off campus in a house that doesn't exist anymore, and my car had the word dyke spray painted on it. Wow. Yep. So huh. the reason I think it could be John was that, you know, if he's on a panel, it would be known more than Mickham on a panel. So you don't know. think John D'Amelio did it? I don't know. What I'm saying is, if somebody wrote dyke on my car as a result of my being on that right. panel, I mean, it's more likely that would be a better attended panel and more widely attended panel potentially because he was on it. Got and it. so, therefore, maybe one of those that the word got around, somebody got angry and spray painted Dyke on the car. How did that make you feel? A little scared. <laughs> I wasn't exactly sure. And in 19, whenever that was, 90 ish, that was, not, that was not a happy welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> Do you remember the card? Um, so there was a street, I think that it's all sort of really changed now, but there was a, like a city street that was very near the business school, that end of campus, and there were little tiny houses on that street. None of them exist anymore as far as I've heard. And Michael and, and a couple other people and I had a house share in one of those houses. How did they know you lived there? Was there a phone book? Or somebody was following me. Oh I wondered about. That's what I wondered about. Was that there were people following me? Did you um, complain to anyone? No, because I didn't think anyone would care. I mean, I just didn't think anything would happen. Did you just drive around? No, nah, we or? cleaned it up. Okay. Michael and I cleaned it up together. Wow. Jeez. I remember it being in some sort of medium that was not as bad as it could have been, and I was able to wash it off. Okay. <laughs> um, any other? Class professors that made an impression, positive, negative? Yeah, those are the folks that come to mind. I mean, I know there were a lot of them. UNCG was a great program. And I remember learning and knowing, like, before I got there and even in the early time of being there, it was the, there was an emphasis on understanding that UNCG was the, the um, branch that was focused on undergraduate teaching uh, and that we should all feel really lucky because if we, UNC Chapel Hill is more famous and seems, you know, better in all kinds of public ways, but really they're more focused on graduate students and they're more, they're less, fewer faculty members teaching undergrads. And that somehow sunk in. I mean, I like, I believe that. And I had great teachers. I wasn't, I wasn't opposed to having graduate student um, teachers, but I had almost none. And, wow. the, and most of the teachers I had were really good that I remember. Okay. Um, so you had to eat in the dining hall? I did. Okay. So did you eat all four years or just? Did just two. Did you, I was on uh, campus. That's a question. Did you enjoy the dining hall? Food? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> so I was a part of a group that organized around, I was a vegetarian, and organized around um, having getting vegetarian and food in because there was, were no vegetarian options. And so I was part of a group that did that. And I was actually, um, here again, somehow seemed to be the one in the group <laughs> to be elected the uh, the person to um, be the more public facing person in the group in a very odd sort of way. So what we noted was that when we did all of the organizing that you would do on our side of the counter to get food, what, what, what seemed to happen is that eventually, as a result of all of our efforts, writing letters and, and visiting people, administrators in their offices, there was a vegetarian entree that was offered, although upon actually getting it and trying it, it seemed like it wasn't vegetarian to us. <laughs> oh. And so I was one of a couple of people who got ourselves jobs in the kitchen so that we could. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> as, as a detective project. See what's going on. Okay. Yeah. And then they, I think they worked out what we were doing there and they didn't want us to stay. But <laughs> so what'd you discover? Um, that, that, that they were not, that was not vegetarian food. It was 
like mystery meat that they were calling vegetarian food, or that you know one of the things we, that we thought what we were supposed to do in this case was to was to educate. Right. Like here, are the vegetarian forms of protein. We actually need protein. What the heck? We can't just eat salad. Yeah. Right. So here are some vegetarian forms of protein that would be super awesome for you to have. And it's like no, it's super complicated stuff. We have to push. Oh, is it going to come back on again? Sorry about that. There we go. Okay. Um, but, like, potatoes with cheese on them or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. Not super complicated stuff. Uh, and what we were, at best, what we were served is like boiled vegetables or salad. And so that was one of the things was to educate about protein. But I think that they were irritated and just started just putting animal so protein in there covered with stuff. Right. So, so what happened? So then we went back to the administrators again and said, is there any way we can get, I know this sounds crazy in this day and age, but can we get a cooler with yogurt or, you know, some other, but we're not vegan for God's sake. <laughs> it's not that hard. <laughs> this is not that hard. Right. We're not. And so we did. And ironically, given my experience when I got to UNCG, all of the athletes took all of the foods in the, in the cooler. <laughs> so make up was angry. Uh -huh. <laughs> So, so were you a big athlete, athletic event supporter? I was not to say <laughs> that those two experiences did sow some seeds for <laughs> feelings about which have been changed and have evolved and there are some nuance now, but I did not feel strongly um, So did the, it was just the male athletes that took the food? That's or? what I assumed. I mean, of course uh, it was probably women too, you know, but we saw right. them. Right. We would stake out in the <laughs> room and watch them and then try to decide. If we if we felt brave enough to go up and tell them that they, that this food was also for vegetarians, and mostly they were really big, and I didn't feel brave enough to go up and try to completely tackle them away from the, the cooler to get my yogurt. And so I started going into the dining hall as soon as it opened in the morning. As and I'm a morning person, so that was not so bad. But that became my habit was to be one of the first people there, like nose on the door, so that I could get to the cooler and get the yogurt. Because apart from that, I was eating. Um, breakfast cereal, which would be dispensed out of these massive towers, every basically every meal. Wow. And you know, bread, peanut butter in my dorm room, and all that. So, did you have other groups you were involved in besides <laughs> um, these that was uh, ad hoc? <laughs> right, it was all ad hoc. Yeah. It was totally. I mean, the, my friends were my friends, but. There were no organized groups with names that did this. We would just, right. those of us who were concerned or otherwise interested, we'd get together and try to make a difference on something. So some uh, group of us were quite, I mean, again, I was doing international studies, right? And I was very interested. One of the great things about the international studies courses was one of the fundamental things, this is also going to seem elementary, but for me it was fantastic, was uh, that some of these courses taught students how to read international news in English in a way that was savvy. God mm -hmm. knows the set of skills we continue to need today. So I became a big time New York Times reader and International Tribune, all those, you know, all kinds of um, news sources. Uh, reading, being a, a sort of critical, thoughtful reader of news sources was, a, was definitely an element of my undergraduate education that I, I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, so I knew that the what we now call the first Gulf War mm -hmm. was going on and was quite upset about it so was a part of a group of students that did that led an action in this uh, thing that now looks really pretty in the center of campus it wasn't pretty when we were there but this pretty sort of sloping lovely aspect of campus that's sort of sculptural and sort of sloping it's sort of when we were there it was just sort of steps and I can't remember if it was on one like behind the library I can't I cannot place it and I should probably try to figure it out on the web but we all stayed there for days at a time and camped there to, to protest the first Gulf War wow yeah so that was an that was an action that I was a part of I also was a part of um, the very first International AIDS Day happened when I was in college and it was of course that's December 1st, which also happens to be my birthday. So the very first International AIDS Day, I was a part of an action. When was that, 90, 91? Yeah, it had to be, yeah, Around it was there. in the 80s. Look yeah. that up. Okay. Yeah. Wow, any other groups? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, this is interesting. Um, so that was, the, what, the, what the interesting thing is, is that I did not know, nor did it even occur to me to imagine that there was an LGBT student center. So I don't know if there even was one then. If there was, I never knew about it, right? I just did the things I did with the people that I knew around the issues that were important to me. Okay. But I never, it never occurred to me to think that there was a structure 
perhaps a program, some some formalized something that the university was offering that would that would make sense to me. Because you didn't feel the university would support no, it that, didn't or just to didn't even occur no, to you? No, I actually think it might be a lack of imagination amongst myself and my friends, or it just, or we were so anti-establishment and mm -hmm. pig-headed that it didn't occur to us to imagine that. Because it's again, it's not like I, I liked my faculty, the faculty members, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I liked, I loved the library. That was my favorite place to hang out, probably on campus. Um, so it wasn't that I was, I was hostile about the university in general. I just don't think it occurred to me that there would be structures like that that would exist. You know, I thought we did that informally as groups of undergraduate students. But it, you know, and it was interesting to me that I would speak publicly at classes about being gay or being whatever it was I conceived of myself as at the time, whatever terms I used, and none of the faculty members would say, did you know that there was, or maybe they assumed that I would know that there's an LGBT right. center, and I just didn't know. So no, it was all informal. But then there was, so we, my group of friends and I, um, usually on Thursday nights, we would, or often, we would come to Durham and dance at the Power Company, gay club. <laughs> And that's when we, it was those journeys back and forth to Greensboro when we would stop at um, the uh, Cracker Barrel, but all the other sort of uh, restaurants of that ilk, Waffle, um, Waffle House, mm -hmm. uh, IHOP, and sometimes Dunkin' Donuts, and sing queer songs. Uh, because there was because because we knew that that there was bad stuff going on where there were queer people who were who were being um, who were losing their jobs and also that they were the, the the way that it first came to my attention was that there were gay groups of one of social groups or whatever groups who were going out to eat together and they were being hassled by other um, at least by other diners if not by the employees of Cracker Barrel and so we decided you know if that's the case we're gonna go in and sing uh, so, can you give me some some names of some of these queer, queer songs? I... Really, they're chants that you hear at at, uh, um, at, at rallies, and at, um, but we would sing, we would do them sing song, um, because we thought if we were happy and sing songy, then we would not we would be at once um, speaking our mind and and telling people what we thought was important, but also fun and happy and not too intimidating, and that they would not be too unhappy with us. How did it we go? We were wrong, but you were wrong. <laughs> I was going to guess that. <laughs> but we but we made you know we stayed as long as we could and um, and we made our point and told them what we thought we could you know what, what we what we thought we could tell them. Again, we were so young, we were not nuanced enough to imagine, for example, that um, that the weight staff person who had actually seated us and was listening to us sing could have been sympathetic and was actually not one of the baddies. You know, we just assumed right. that everybody in, the, right. in there was a, was a baddie. Like, if you're there, you got to be. That's a problem. Right? So, that, again, that's just part and parcel of being super young. And we were not hostile to anybody. We would... I remember one Waffle House in the middle of the night. We... You know, they're very small and sort of... Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? We sang and danced because we had just come from the club. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. restaurant wow. Uh -huh. and into the bathrooms and then came and then stood there for a minute and thought I wonder what will happen if we come out <laughs> and then we came out and sang and danced our way back down the aisle and by the time we got to our booth the folks were like yeah what are you <laughs> so this is what like two three in the morning yeah here's the door <laughs> wow you guys probably want to carry you off back to wherever you're going but you didn't necessarily have um like really ugly uh interactions yeah well I mean we had people yell stuff at us but again stupidly we didn't we weren't as scared as we probably should have been okay I mean for example I don't think it would ever have occurred to me that somebody might have had a, a gun or a knife or just a desire to f physically attack us somehow I think we had some sort of um, overly confident feeling about being together as a group how big was your group not very big <laughs> <laughs> Out of max, four, five. That's small. Yeah. And we were small. <laughs> Some of us. Okay. Um, you know what? I also thought at the time, you know, I didn't have children. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do for the rest of my life. I had, I, there was some feeling that you, I think you have as an activist. Um, and I was a total child, you know, child. But um, when you engage in public forms of protest or activism that if this is how I go this is how I go because I believe so much I believe so deeply so deeply so deeply in um, 
queer liberation, I believe so deeply in feminism, I believe so deeply in pacifism, that if that's how I'm going to go, believing that out loud in public, wow, that's okay. I wasn't really scared. I mean, I'm not saying that to valorize myself at all, because it was also part and parcel of being kind of young and stupid and not imagining that I had a future that was all that important. All I was was that moment. Did you think it came to UNCG that way? or? Yeah, I mean, I was pretty unhappy in high school, and I had a lot, I, I had a lot of built up mm -hmm. stuff that I, I wanted to get out of myself that I couldn't even identify in high school about being, you know, a lot of all the things that I don't think were acceptable in that high school. Okay. So you did a lot of activist yeah. work. Were you involved in any other, like, chess club or? <laughs> <laughs> No, I have okay. a lot of time for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. So for fun, you went to the power company. Yeah. What, what else? There's some restaurant not so far away from campus, someplace we could walk. Um, I know. So I, I put myself through college. So I had I didn't have a lot of spare time because uh, I had was to had two um, majors. I feel I'm almost certain that international studies was a major by the time I finished it. Um, just because of the feeling of accomplishment of having defied that guy wanted. So I feel like, so two majors and a, and a minor in women's studies, there, there was not a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And plus that, in order to support myself, I worked uh, as a receptionist in the dorm, mm -hmm. and I worked at Edwin McKay Used Books, mm -hmm. and I worked for a caterer. Wow. And I sort of worked the night shift all night for the, you know, or into the night for the caterer, and then I would work the, you know, phones in the dorm, and I would work whenever I could at the at the bookstore. And then during the summers, I, I always had jobs too, because I never moved home, I always had jobs. I worked as a painter during the first summer, you know, the summer after, for, I think after my first year, after my second year. Anyway, so I always had a lot of jobs, so there was not a lot of spare time. Did you date? Yeah, I did. Um, the only guy I dated was Michael. All the other people I dated were women. But did none of them, you, you know, for long. Did you feel you could be out as a couple on campus? Yeah, I mean, I actually did feel pretty good about UNCG. For whatever reason, most of the people I met were not other uh, students. So the first woman I dated just wasn't, she was just a person who lived in Greensboro. She wasn't, um, how in the world? I think it was, it was the used bookstore. Um, I encountered these people. And again, I must have been wearing the, because I didn't wear, for the most part, shirts that said anything, but I must have given off the vibe. Um, because that's how I met a number of the women that I dated, only one of whom I think was actually a student um, a student at the school, which is a funny story. But uh, Do you yeah. want to tell the funny story? <laughs> or the... I can only do that if I don't name names, because it's you not can, fair to name names. Do you, do you can do that? She was, um, so there was a pretty significant lesbian uh, community, um, and I was not acceptable to many of them because I identified as bi. And that was another thing that was, I believed myself to be, I continued to believe myself to be, but also I thought it was an important political space to occupy because I knew that that was an embattled people hate us kind of space. And again, I was young and stupid. And it was like, I'm gonna be there so that I can defend that space. And also I dated this guy and I really, really, really loved him. So I must be bi. So um, amazingly, the queen lesbian who everybody <laughs> everybody adored and who was you know the kind of lesbian who was ne who had never ever even thought about a man let alone slept with a man and who everybody wanted to date and who was in a relationship with an older woman for x number of years and then was single and that everybody wanted to date and thought was the most important person in the entire community asked me out it was like okay that's cool <laughs> and so first of all everybody was upset because and I, how many people were we talking about it? No, it was a big. It was a, It was not. It was a sizable. She had a sizable community. Right. She Can had you a just give me following. an estimate of? So, and when I would go over to her house for right. gatherings, and when she was with her partner, um, there were always forty or fifty people there for these Men parties. Men and women. Mostly women. Wow. And the, all UNCG students. No, no it was a uh, combination. Okay. Yeah, when you of say community, and community. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Got it. So she asked me out at the bookstore. I never thought about the bookstores being as generative as Dossie was. Anyway, so I said, sure, okay. Um, of course, I knew, everybody knew her, and um, I actually made a joke to her. I said, you know, people are going to be pretty upset about this. She said, yeah, I love that. But, you know, I was thinking about asking you out, and let's just set those people aside. You want to go out? Sure, I said. So we're in Greensboro, and she decides that she's going to take me out to dinner in Chapel Hill, which I didn't realize until she picked me up. <laughs> I said, we're on the way to Chapel Hill, and I thought, this seems... 
long way to go for a meal. <laughs> so we go all the way to Chapel Hill tonight. Wow. Okay. And about 20 or 30 minutes of dinner, I thought, I think mean, she's great, but I, she's not really, this is not going to actually go anywhere. That's fine. I'm not worried about that, but shit. You have the rest of the day, and all the way back to Chapel Hill, and there are all those people who are going to be weird about it, you know. So we just, I just tried to be cool at the dinner, and then on the way back, she said, "Oh, um, I actually invited some people to the house. Will you come with me, and to my house, you know, and have a drink?" And I was like, "What is this about?" And she said, "Well, I just thought it would be fun. You could meet maybe some of my friends you haven't met before." And I thought, I just immediately thought, "No, <laughs> no, and I don't want to do that because I don't see a future in this, and I don't want people to misunderstand. They're already going to be hostile to me, mm-hmm. and they're going to think that I've." been unkind to her, but I just, I, I was befuddled. I wasn't exactly sure what to do. So I went and I just remember thinking, this is all wrong, not good. Um, uh, and, you know, after a couple of weeks, I said, you know, I really, I hope that you're thinking the same thing I am, that this has been, I really like you and you're an amazing human being, but we're not really meant to date. And she said, yeah, I kind of see that too. But I have to admit to you that my friends thought we were, and there was this big hoo-ha. And so you're probably going to catch some shit. And boy, did I catch some shit. So it wasn't okay to date her, and it wasn't okay not to date her, Beth Ann. Because it was not okay to date her because I was bisexual. It was not okay not to because she was who she was. I should understand that I was the luckiest person in the world. And that's her attitude or everyone no, else's? Yeah. So it was, real, you, it was a dry catch for me for a while. Because I was a pariah. Wow. So and when you, you say you were, that they gave you shit, how would you define the shit? Oh, I would see them around right. town or on campus or whatever, and they would be nasty. They would just be hostile and say and, and make a remark about how I don't understand. You know, I'm bisexual. You don't get that she was the most amazing person. She is the most amazing person in Greensboro who's a lesbian, and you had that chance. You're like, boy, that's wow. my business, but okay. <laughs> Did you have any, anyone in the, uh, anywhere in the queer community that was sympathetic? Yeah, sympathetic, empathetic. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, mostly men. Yeah, not the women. They were very head up about it, the ones that I encountered. So, but the amazing thing was is that I happened to be looking for, um, so I kept this house the whole two years of junior and senior year after I moved off campus, and Michael transferred, and our uh, other original housemates went on and did their own thing. So there were, were occasions where I needed housemates, and we really did get along well. It was totally fine. We were just not meant to date. No big deal. So I said, needed a place to live. And so I I called her and I said, I know this is going to be strange after all that craziness, but I need a housemate and I think you and I get along really well. And she said, yeah, actually, I think we do. And that would be great. I do need a house. So, and she moved with the partner who is still her partner. Um, So what were your proudest accomplishments or contributions during your time at UNCG? I think... Um, having whatever it took to go to the, the, the first one was going to the head of the, um, or the titular head of the International Studies Program and telling him what I thought we needed to tell him. Mm-hmm. And then pushing back when he made the, that super god awful inappropriate remark. I think that was important. And trying to be supportive to all those women and say, you know, we can band together, we can overcome. But also to say, if you don't want to, if you want to bounce, I get it too. <laughs> this right. is, you know, this just your first it. year. Yeah. Doing this first week first or so, semester. First couple, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I felt really good about that. Um, I felt really good, I guess, about the you know the all the activism we participated in um, in opposition to the first Gulf War, because we were so making it up as we went along. You know, we were such puppies. And um, what I don't remember was that there were people, faculty or staff, or otherwise on campus, who were sort of mentoring us in that. They're, they could have been there, and maybe it's my faulty memory. I totally am open to that. But in my mind's eye, it's all students trying to figure out how you do a protest in a space at a college campus to say, this is what we believe. But the same thing for the feminist activism and the queer activism I did. I felt good about that. I felt like it was the, you know, what I had been waiting all my life to be able to do. And I am grateful to UNCG for being whatever it needed to be to allow me to do it or make it possible or whatever. It was the right chemistry, the right combination of things. So you didn't get any blowback from the administration? I don't remember it. Yeah. Security? I don't remember it. Isn't that great? I don't. That is good. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you have uh, any thoughts on the Chancellor Moran at the time? I don't. I didn't. Okay. Uh, do you have any thoughts on our current Chancellor, Gilliam? I don't. 
my only sort of campus activism was about the vegetarian food and the dining hall. Everything else was about, you know, bigger yeah. social issues. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so before you came to UNCG, you were out to yourself, but were you out to anyone else? No. Okay. Nobody. All right. Uh, so you sort of said that you know that you felt like the atmosphere was okay for yeah. LGBTQ students. Did you know about UNC gay? Yeah. When before you came? No, but I did while I was there. Okay. And were there any official campus groups that you were a part of or that you knew of and weren't a part of? I can't remember. Probably not the student center. I never knew about that, but there were probably probably were. I just can't I just can't pull that out of my head. Um because, you know, I knew, especially lots of gay men um, on campus. Most of the lesbians I knew were um, in the community or not necessarily on campus. Most of my, the, my friends on campus were gay men. My queer friends on campus were gay men. Young gay men and who had difficult childhoods for the most part and were in a lot of pain. Hmm. And we commiserated over that. Did you talk about, um, or did anyone know about the 1982 um, I didn't. incident where Kenneth, Kenneth Crump committed suicide? Yeah, I no, didn't. Didn't talk about that? Okay. I didn't know. You didn't know about it, yeah. sir. Um, are there any places on campus that you felt most comfortable? The library. Library. Was that you personally, or was that a good queer space? Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for anybody else. I mean, it was, I loved it. I was a geek for it, and there's another thing I didn't realize. I was a geek. I used to, yes, sit around, and um, I did what, what queer folks do in times of yore. I would sit around with reference books and other books and look up queer people and queer things and find the queer stuff. <laughs> I loved the library for having that. You know, I mean, it did not in the same sense that it would have it now or that um, we collected here or whatever, but the library has always been, uh, the library writ large has always been a place that LGBTQ folks one of those places to go to find themselves, and I did, and I loved it. And so what I found was, of course, how nutritious it was to find that, how incredibly, incredibly satisfying it was to find that, which then instilled in me a huge pleasure in just the research process. I loved it. And then it only long, long after that occurred to me that there would also be pleasure derived in, um, in providing services, mm -hmm. you know, in a ref reference way. So did you find all this this material on your, by yourself, or did you have any help with For the most part, by myself. Okay. So but then, once I got my <laughs> courage up, you know, I would ask here and there of librarians. But mostly, mostly, it was myself, because I was still really worried about, I mean, I didn't know who these people were, I didn't right. know, you know how they'd react. But I don't remember any negative experiences. I just remember them all being professional. Do you have a place you like to hang out in the library, like a physical space? Uh, I liked. The, I, I was careful, so I was a part of that that you know sort of um, self defense, take back the night sort of generation. So I was very careful not to be in the stacks by myself and all that. You know, I knew all those things, so it was mostly in more public areas. And again, I, I liked the reference area. It was really big back then. It's not the same as they are now in university libraries. It was super big, and and I would geek out on the reference books. <laughs> Very sweet. Yep. And so, and I had, I did international studies and psychology and women's studies. So there were all kinds of different reference books for all those different topics, and I explored them all. Reference books. Um, I, you know, so I was destined to go to library school. I think. <laughs> Though I had no idea, no, not the, not the blindest clue about it at the time. Okay, we'll get to that. Yeah. Um, just a few more things about campus or on campus. Um, were there places off campus that, you said you didn't go to bars, but did you know of queer bars in Greensboro or other social gathering places? It seemed like you mostly hung out at friends' people's houses. houses. Yeah. Um, it was mostly people's houses uh, and the bookstore where I worked. I mean, I, was, I, I could not be out there. That was, the, the really? manager was not a cool bean. Hmm. So I had this, and everybody, um, all the queer folks who came through there seemed to have the right instincts, or most of them anyway, and the ones I knew and everything, and I was careful, except for the, this one woman whom I dated who did not understand what was necessary and important about how she deported herself there. So that was a, its own story. It was just, I needed the job. I really needed the job. And frankly, I liked the job. I mean, apart from him, I liked all the other coworkers. I liked the job. I liked working in books, obviously, uh, it became my life. Um, 
and I, I met her there, and she, she was just a, a firecracker of a person who thought that um, it made sense just to be out everywhere all the time, really loudly. Mm -hmm. Who cares what anybody thinks? And I remember I would take her outside um, and say, I get that, and I so support it, but I need this job. Could you just be cool in here? But we're dating, and everybody should know that. Oh. No, please, please. Did she respect that? No. No. Yeah. And so uh, that, and for other reasons, I finally had to say, that when she, and I know you're going to think I'm making this up, but I'm not. When she announced to me in the bookstore that, there, that lesbianism means no space between two women, I was like, okay, let me affect an exit strategy right now. She really said those words. So then, you know, I worked as carefully and as gently and as compassionately as I could to And that relationship, sadly, I really liked her a lot. She was lovely, she, and she was finding her own way politically and otherwise. So I got that. I just needed that. Didn't want to lose that job. Right. And I like the spaces and our togetherness. Part of human interaction. <laughs> so. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Did you ever feel any, you know, specific discrimination while at UNCG? I mean, there was the you know, Guilford jocks that... And the dude, who the faculty member. Right, and then the dike on your car. That too. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's that. <laughs> Anything else we missed or um, in, around those town? Those are the ones that came to mind when I saw that question. Okay. And the, the vegetarianism, I mean, that's a kind of discrimination, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I really had a hard time making that point. We were really treated like we were um, being ridiculous. Did that resolve by the time you graduated in a good way, or you still were fighting? I think we were pretty much still fighting it, yeah. Okay. Um, or somebody was. I had moved off campus. Okay, is there any other uh, things you want to talk about? Um, we're going to go post-UNCG, but is there any other UNCG-ish things you want to mention? I think, that's the, okay. I think that's the stuff. Okay. So you graduated in 1992. Did you know what you wanted to do? I thought I did. I right, you, you did. You applied this to a right. program. That uh, didn't happen. That so what did you do for the year of... I came to Durham because that's where I had spent so much of my time. Michael, my best buddy, um, his family was from here, and we spent a lot of our time here during the weekends and um, really liked the place. I really liked Ninth Street, and mm -hmm. so I applied for jobs uh, on Ninth Street, Ninth Street Bakery and Wellspring Grocery and all those places, and got jobs at all those places, so chose Ninth Street Bakery which was an awesome place to work in the early 90s. Really, really great place um, to work. A bunch of people who just graduated from college and lots of great energy and progressive folks and all that good stuff. So I got an apartment with um, a roommate. No, I can really think hard about who that was. Um, within walking distance, I think, or at least very pretty close by, Ninth Street Bakery, and that was, you know, that was my little life. I, so I shared a car with Michael for the first two or three years. As long as he, was, as he was on campus, he ended up transferring to the design program at State. And so when he left, so did his car. And I, I bought a car for $500 with my earnings from catering or Edwin McKay's used books or whatever. So I still had that little tiny Subaru hatchback, 1980, whatever. That's what I had when I moved here. And it was covered in left-wing, you know, <laughs> stickers. Uh, all over the back of it. It was awesome. So I started my little life in Durham, and I loved Durham almost right away. And that was part of the reason why I decided that uh, going back to UNCG to this master's program was probably not. And also, I don't think that, I didn't think that the profession actually made sense. So what one is told about the beginning of an MED counseling program is that, of course, you should not be released into the, the real world at anybody because you don't know anything. And so you sort of practice the first kinds of counseling skills that you learn on each other. And that was like, eh, I don't think so. Because right. I was still, even though I was um, a badass in some sense, activist, and I was out and whatever else, I was not all, still all that interested in talking about myself to people I didn't know. So uh, that was off-putting. And maybe it was not an accurate depiction of what would actually happen, but based on my research, that would be the case. And also, I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do, except that I wanted to take some more time off. Okay. So then what happened? So I worked at Nicery Bakery. Michael worked there. A lot of other cool folks worked there. Um, I engaged in activism here, which was cool, but in a sort of quieter, trying to figure out what to do way. And then 
I didn't think I was going to tell this story. I don't know if I should tell this story, Beth Ann. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I was, unbeknownst to me, I was being, I don't know if I can tell this story. I was a victim of a crime. I'm sorry, I didn't know. Yeah, a pretty bad one, which sort of changed the rest of my life. And I'm not sure if this is the right venue to talk about it, but it is relevant because it was within the first year I was in Durham and um, I left for a while just to get my head back together again. But I ultimately came back. Uh, which was great, and um, met the person who was the original head of the Women's History Archive at Duke. And uh, she was working at Ninth Street Bakery. I worked at Ninth Street Bakery on and off for several years. It was that kind of place. You could go and come back and whatever. And I had other jobs at the time. In fact, one of the great jobs I had um, was that I inherited, if you will, uh, a business called Dykes Against Dirt. <laughs> Who are, the woman who was running it, whose name maybe you can come up with. But was I 40? An Australian woman. I feel like she no. was an Aussie. Um, Antipodean of some extraction. She had this business. She had a bunch of clients she, whose houses she cleaned. Some of them were queer and some of them weren't. Whatever else. She called it Dice Against Dirt and she was leaving. Did I do a master program somewhere? I don't remember. Anyway, she was looking for somebody to give these clients to and I wanted the extra money and didn't sleep much back then, so I thought, I'll do that, and I'll do the bakery, and I'll earn money, and as I'm figuring out what to do in my life. So I did that too, which was an interesting experience, um, because some of those people were became Duke administrators who I worked with in another capacity at Duke. <laughs> anyway, that was all very interesting. Um, so I'm, the person who was the Women's Studies Archivist at Duke was working at Nice Street Bakery the same time I was. Why would she do that? Because she also was a person who had a lot of energy, wanted to earn extra money, um, and she wanted to she worked in a vegetarian cafe in an earlier chapter of her life and wanted that experience again and wanted to earn money towards buying a kayak. So she was there, I was there. Do we, we want to name her? Yeah, Jenny Daly. I'm happy to name her. Um, we fell into conversation and uh, this was in the first year I was out of school and I, UNCG and I said, so um, what does a person do who really just wants to spend their life doing some kind of activism for LGBT people? Um, we weren't really saying queer back then yet, I don't think. Were you saying LGBT, Feminism, though? I probably. I think I was. I'm sure I was. Good Into to the alphabet by then. What do you do? How can you do that? Pay your bills. That's, that's what's most meaningful to me. How do I do it? And she said, oh, I got this idea, actually. There's this other thing I do besides coming to this cafe all the time. And she described the Women's History Archive at Duke, and I was just amazed by it. Um, but still, you know, I was doing my place get started. I was doing my restaurant, I was just trying to figure out what I was going to do, um, and she said, you know, if you ever feel like it, why don't you just come by and visit? So then this very bad thing happened to me, uh, and I left for a while, but then when I came back into town, I got in touch with her, and I said, would you still let me come around? And she said, yeah, just do. And so I came around, and the collection she set me next to was the Atlanta Lesbian Feminist Alliance. Wow. And what year is this about? So this was about 1993 or four. Okay. Four. It was four. Um, and so the Atlanta Lesbian and Feminist Alliance was a collective from 1972 to 94. So they had just sunsetted. I did the activism I did at UNCG from about, whatever, 88 or 89 to 92. I knew that I was a puppy and didn't know what I was doing. I was looking at the records of these people who did know what they were doing. And I fell head over, heels over, head over heels in love with them, with this material, with this idea that I could do something to preserve this material. And, you know, I, it immediately resonated with me. Preserve, provide access to this material, make this material available, push this material out so that everybody could see it, so that everybody could uh, inform their activism with a historical perspective. It made sense to me full blown right away that moment instantly. It was everything. It was like, I could not believe that I ever thought about doing anything else. It was so great. I mean, Alpha, Alpha made me, Alpha birthed me. So I, worked in this collection for a really long time and you know for the course of like nine months which for me at that point was a long time doing anything while I was doing Dice Against Dirt and working in the bakery um, and so then I, I went to library school um, and continued to work here and I worked at Duke I worked at Southern Historical I worked at you know I was the very first one of the very first um, drill interns which is an internship in the University Archives at Duke I was the first reference intern in the Southern Historical Collection that you would see Chapel Hill. I set up the very first um, e-reference service at, at the Southern Historical Collection. I had amazing mentors here and at Duke and there at UNC, 
Chapel Hill. I had I was I was extremely lucky. I was extremely lucky. I, I had worked, you know, too many jobs and too many internships, but by the time I finished, you know, I really knew it about, or at least, you know, I had really steeped myself in modern manuscripts and especially in women's and LGBT history. So the first job I got hadn't, was modern manuscripts, but it had nothing specifically to do with those other two things. But I decided, as I had decided in different ways and different chapters of my life, I will make it that. Who cares what these people think or what this job description says? I will make it that. You know, because Jenny Daly said, she showed me, I see from my own experience, that women and gay people are written out of historical records. So I got this degree. I know how to undo that. I know how to fix it. I'm going to do that. So I kept proposing projects and doing projects um, that were on those topics. Um, I noted that none of, almost none of the manuscript collections were on um, or cataloged onto OCLC, which was what that institution was doing my very first job. Uh, and so I did all that. I cataloged every single solitary one of them on OCLC, which is sad for them because I'm not a great cataloger. <laughs> Now they're there. Um, I did a number of different women's history projects while I was there. And this um, is at Chapel Hill? Yeah, this was at... Um, Southern Historical. No, no, it was actually after all those. It was my first professional job at University of Toledo in oh. Ohio. And then um, I went to Emory, and again, my, well, my job is there was coordinator of public services in the Special Collections Library, which, again, doesn't really say anything about women or queer people. But... I was going to do that, and I had a boss who was um, said, "If you can do everything that you have to do in this job description, and you still have energy for more, and she, you would appreciate her." She said, "You, you look like you do. <laughs> <laughs> Your affect suggests that you might." <laughs> I had a lot of energy still then. Um, then, tell me what you want to do, and maybe I'll support you because I'm interested in women's history too. And so I did. Uh, I did all kinds of projects conferences and workshops and all kinds of different library instruction about all these topics and I uncovered and excavated all of these materials that I had not really been called attention to before in the collection uh, which was great that she supported me. I worked with the women's studies department at Emory which was particularly exciting because it has a PhD program in women's studies which is very unusual so I got very close to all those people too and, and um, so I'm very grateful to Linda Matthews the head of Special Collections at Emory at the time for giving me the space and the time because frankly she get, gave me more than just after 40 hours she gave me real space and time and resources to do it which was pretty pretty awesome and probably was why I was a successful candidate here I was recruited the job came open, my current job came open at Duke. I never thought it would, never for a, in a million years. It's one of only a handful of jobs like it in the country. And um, the head of special questions here at the time, Rob Bird, called me and said, this job is open and you know I've been paying attention to your career and I remember when you were here, would you apply? And I was so happy at Emory and so happy in Atlanta. Nah, I'm good. But he, and so he called me again and he said, no, really, you should apply. And I said, you know, I'm not really sure I want to give up when I'm happy doing and um, I like my boss and all that. And, he called me a third time and he said, just do it, just do it. There's nothing you can lose here. Just come. Okay. So I did. And it was a terrible, god awful, very bad experience of being a quasi intro candidate at Duke, you know, just really ridden hard and put away wet that day and didn't feel, I felt like I must have been everybody's afterthought. I did not feel like anybody was interested. I didn't feel like I had any chance at the job. I remember having had experience in Durham, I drove from um, Atlanta, Durham. I was really happy to be here again. At the end of the day, I thought, well, not going to get the job, but it's great to be in Durham again. And I, I went to, um, oh God, what was it called? That Fowler's, was it right? Mm -hmm. uh, and had a beer and, or whatever, somewhere nearby there at a bar and thought, well, at least I, I, I was back here. That was cool. And then I drove back to Atlanta and thought nothing will ever come of this. And then I was offered the job and it was shocking to me. And what but year I, is this? Like 2002. And what is your official title now for the record? My official title is that I am the Merle Hoffman Director of the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture and the Curator of Gender and Sexuality History Collections in the David M. Rubenstein Rare Book and Manuscript Library at Duke University. I have two business cards. Did say to be continued? <laughs> That's um, right. Um, no, I'm very, very lucky. Uh, Ginny Daly, the person I mentioned earlier, um, worked with you know, she created the, the Sally Bingham Center, um, but she also worked on, with the whole wide range of um, LGBT and sexuality history collections um, as well. Her, the person between us, the permanent director between us, did not. She focused entirely on the Bingham Center, which was fine. And when I came here, I won't surprise any listener to know that I, I knew Ginny and I knew she did that. And I said, is there room for me to do the queer stuff too? <laughs> 
yes, they said, that would be great. I said, good, because I want to do that. Um, and it's been fantastic. It's been really wonderful. I can't imagine not working with uh, the whole, you know, the whole umbrella. Uh, but the wonderful thing about the Bigham Center is even from its very beginnings in the middle 1980s, we had four areas of collecting. Uh, four, so that really means that what you, we, we're spending 25% of our time, right? As more or less on each one of them. One of that, one of those four, starting in 1987 or eight when we started, was called lesbian life and culture. So, um, yeah, it's a huge, proud, wonderful, deep, fantastic, and amazing focus of what we do here, which I love. Hurrah! Um, just a few more UNCG questions. Um, have you been involved with the school since you graduated? I haven't really. Okay. Um, have you been involved in organizations, um, I mean your job is, is, you know, I think activist in and of itself. Um, any professional organizations, community organizations, well, professional organizations, of course, all right. those you would expect. I have an RBMS, an right. American Library Association, Rare Books and Manuscripts section person. Um, even though, well, it's not relevant to this interview, that wasn't exactly the obvious organization for me to join. I joined it as a result of a particular set of circumstances, but I don't regret it. It's awesome. And my job really is as much rare books and other print materials as it is manuscripts um, So and archives, so that's wonderful. Um, but in, in terms of other kinds of organizations, the trick is, or it has been, uh, that I feel like I have to um, be in this very specific piece of territory where I can and do, um, and I'm completely committed to advocating for all of my donors, whoever they are, the feminists, the queer people, the non-feminists, the non-queer people. Um, but I also represent Duke, so I can't really join any of their organizations. I've been asked over the years a number of times to join them. Joining maybe their boards is something I've done and is not outside the bounds, but joining their organizations as a member is not a possibility because it's, a, to my mind, a conflict of interest with being the person who um, documents their history and has, represents the institution that documents their history and has a contractual relationship with them around their records and all those archival things. So I have not joined any organizations around here, which is sort of sad because there are a bunch of really awesome ones that I wouldn't have minded joining. But I, you know, as often as not, I go and march in the gay pride parade, um, and uh, I go and, you know, to the shows of the Common Woman Chorus, and you know, I do all those. I mean, I do a whole wide range of, of things with the community. I just, actually, I, they were so lovely. The Common Woman Chorus. Um, asked me many, many more times than most organizations to join, and really the main reason I couldn't do that was I can't, you know, carry a tune in a bucket, and I kept telling them, really, this is not good for you. <laughs> but we had such a lovely rapport. I love them. Okay. Um, how have larger issues in the nation, like uh, the Supreme Court ruling in favor of same-sex marriage or the passage of HB2, affected you? I think, in the, uh, for the most part, I focus on how they affect my the donors of collections of funds as well, of course, but uh, because we have some of those. But donors of collections, for the most part, is how they how their lives are affected. Um, but also how I can uh, foreground all of those issues in my um, in the professional organization, the Rare Books and Manuscripts organization, in which I. I practice and obviously in my work. So in 2015, when that Supreme Court decision was made, um, I had the joy, the honor of co-chairing uh, the Rare Books and Manuscripts section conference, which doesn't sound like much, but it was actually a 565 person international conference. And part of the focus of that conference took in the idea of um, queer archives and activist archives. Um, I was the program co-chair, so I couldn't do that. And I got a lot of people on board who were also interested in doing that. And I would say that that was one of the first conferences in our organization that took on those. So the Society of American Archivists have been doing that for some time, and certainly state uh, archival organizations have been doing that for some time. Um, but for RBMS, which was, mostly, which was a pre-1801 rare book organization until more recently than I care to admit, uh, to do a modern, ar you know, activist archival oriented conference in 2015 was actually pretty revolutionary. And so I, it was my, um, we shared the speaking duties at the conference. Uh, the, the, I was, happened to be 
and it was or, it was choreographed ahead of time. The person who was going to be the per person of the leadership to speak after the Supreme Court decision wow. was made, uh, and I was introducing Chris Berg, who was the keynote speaker that day. Um, Chris Berg is a very important person in, in our our profession. I, I know a person who was steeped in some amount of controversy, but that's partly because she is so courageous and willing to do and say what she believes in. She's now the director of libraries at MIT, but a very outspoken uh, queer librarian. Is it C-R-I-S? C-H-R-I-S and then Berg is B-O-U-R-G. Thank you. Um, I had asked her long before to be a speaker in the conference and she agreed to do it and I knew she would be you know, a very outspoken advocate for all of the issues that are very important to her about diversity, equity, and inclusion in libraries and in le library leadership and queer librarianship and the whole nine yards and that's what I wanted. Um, so it was my, but it was my task to get up and welcome everybody and um, introduce her. And I knew, I know my colleagues, I mean it might have been a pre-1801 book group for most of its history, but it was, it's a pre-1801 book group that first of all has a huge number of gay men and a huge number of older gay men who are in long-term relationships with other gay men and plenty of uh, women in relationships with women. So I got to stand up and um, try not to cry as I talked about it, and I could cry just thinking about it, about what we were all experiencing. And I looked out in this audience of 500 people, and I saw that everybody, gay, straight, and everybody in between, was elated. Like, everything is possible now. Love wins. And I got to say, love won. And it was before November of 2016, and we believed it. We believed it. We still do, but it was easier to believe then. And then I got to introduce Chris Berg, who came up and put her arm around me and talked about what it meant to her and the fact that to be, she was, she's a firecracker. She was like, look, I'd rather actually be with my wife, but if I'm not with my wife, I'm glad to be with you guys because I can see what this means to you. And I, and I can, um, you know, I can celebrate this with you all and it's incredibly meaningful because I can see how important and meaningful it is to you as it is to me. And we spent the first part of her, she spent the first part of her, her keynote sort of talking about that. And wow. everybody loved it. Wow. Loved it. There was not a dry eye. Okay. Thank you. Two more questions. Uh, tell me how UNCG has affected your life and what it means to you. Well, I mean, I haven't thought about UNCG so much in years. So I appreciate, very grateful for this opportunity and um, to sort of refocus on the fact that it was a much more formative time. And I think it's not that I have not given a credit for that. I simply haven't thought about it in a long time. 30 years is a long time from when I started uh, there. and. So I'm glad to have had this opportunity to reflect on um, how great it was to have a space to become the person that I couldn't be in high school, which was then the foundation for what I would become afterwards, which is so far from perfect and still trying to figure out so many things, but so much more than I thought was possible when I graduated from high school. So we're doing these interviews as part of the 125th anniversary of the university. Um, but also helps us think about the future besides reflecting on the past. Do you have any concept of where you might see UNCG going as an institution in the next 25, 30 years? Um, I don't know. I mean, so I spent my life working with uh, undergraduate students, right? I mean, this is my life here. So I want all institutions of higher learning, but of course my alma mater, um, to rededicate themselves to um, all of the things that, that uh, we hold true and understand to be possible from higher education, especially higher education for marginalized people, first generation college students, people, uh, working class people, people of color, queer people. We exist to make everything possible for them. That's why, that's why we're here and that's what we need to continue to redouble our commitment to and our effort to uh, be a part of and, and to make possible in every different way that we can. And I, and I know that, that UNCG can do that because it did it for me and I want it to continue to do that. Okay. I don't have any other questions or anything that you wanted to add that didn't no, cover? I think I covered a lot of territory. Okay. Well, thank you, Laura. Thank you, Bethann.